11,000. Bye, have a great time. Have a great time. Genocide. 116 total humans. So, can you beat Pal World without using any pals? Hello and welcome to our new journey where we do our best not only to survive, but to beat the game using nothing but our own human potential. But can we really beat the game without using pals to fight, farm, smelt, and travel for us? Let's go and find out. To start off, this playthrough will be on regular difficulty. Custom settings are not allowed. Game breaking glitches or exploits cannot be used. And lastly, of course, no catching or using any pals for any reason. With all that out of the way, let's hop into it. Hello, hello, and welcome. So there are three goals I want to achieve. One is to defeat all world and tower bosses. Two is to catch one of every type of human, a type being a unique character model. And three, Max condense one of those humans to become the supreme being of all beings in Pal World. We won't actually be alone because we're going to ethically source as many humans as possible to work for our cause because according to the game, technically humans are not pals. Wait, I hear a shiny. Challenge failed. Alright, next world. Ah, deja vu. Looks like we got distracted there for a second. So we'll start off how we start off every game. By getting wood, stone, and humans of course. But before we get any humans, we're gonna need the basic tools. So we made a total of 12 pal spheres and now we're ready to get them. Oh my gosh, half my health is gone. So we were really struggling here for a second. I thought that we were going to go through all of our balls and have to craft more. But in the end, we got pretty lucky. Come on, come on. I'm about to die. Hello? Oh, come on. Three balls. Please. Oh, we got her. Oh my gosh. Let's go. So luckily, right in the nick of time as I died, we were able to capture her and obtain our first member. Our first companion. Welcome to the team. Your name will be... Say hello to Shadi. Alright, quick lesson. Like us 21st century humans, Pal World humans don't have genders, so they can't be forcefully bred for better stats and passives. They also have no other attacks other than punch, and teaching them any move will just break their AI. In general, humans are very weak. That is why this is considered a challenge run. They at least have level 1 handiwork so they can help you build and craft. You can, and I will be, blending 116 humans into the pale condenser to make me one superhuman. So, so stay tuned. By the way, the HR department has found a pretty nice asset. Let's test her out. Shoddy, go use punch! Not bad, shoddy. After getting some more materials, we finally start heading down to see if we can find any more victims to join our cause. Hey look, that's future subordinate number two. Oh, oh no, they spawned right next to us. Shoddy, no! Officer, that's racial profiling! What? What? Sir! Officer! He was innocent! Okay. Yeah.
Hey, look, he's back already. We could go for round number two. One Pokeball, come on, please. Oh my gosh, 30 Pokeballs, let's go. Chicken, will you avenge your comrade? No, I, I guess not. Ah, okay. All part of the plan, all good. I think we could restart the game as well, like go to the main menu and come back, but this works. We have now died twice to the authorities, but I think we're off to a great start. And before we forget, let's name our guild the Department of Human Resources. You know what? Skilled Islander? Pacific Islander? We're gonna name him The Rock. Welcome to the team, The Rock. So I'm going to pre-mark this spot on the map. If I've planned through this correctly, this area will become absolutely vital for us in order to progress into the mid-game. And I'll tell you why as we make our way towards it. For now, we're going to skip basing entirely and focus on leveling up, getting more companions, and exploring. It wasn't long before we unlocked the Rain Syndicate Tower waypoint and found our first dungeon. We're a bit under-leveled right now, so we'll save it for a bit later. Just up these steps, we found some Team Rocket grunts fighting. Maybe if one of them gets low enough, we can capture them. Okay, that's not good. Shortly after escaping the grunts, I found out that our second party member does zero damage. Useless. Regardless of my team members being dead and incapable of fighting, I continued on until we found our first settlement. Such a nice and peaceful village, I hope I don't do anything bad to its people. Since we don't have that much use for money right now, we're going to buy as many Pokeballs and Arrows as we can afford. Off in the distance, there's some fighting going on, so I go and investigate. There he is, all alone and injured. Easy peasy. Because you're a thug, a criminal, and have a bat, you will be named Battery. My naming sense and humor is impeccable. It was finally getting to nighttime, and I still had no form of mobility, so to get where I wanted to go, I climbed and climbed. Eventually, we'll want to get a grappling hook and a glider, but in order to get a grappling hook, we'll need ingots. Unfortunately, without a fire pal, we can't craft ingots. Oh, what will we do? For now, there's a new human type for us to capture just over the cliff. And this one is quite interesting. Oh my god, look at that damage. Oh my. Imagine if they punch that much damage. Oh, so little did I know at the time. Hmm, easy peasy. Yeah. Actually, he's pretty low HP right now. We'll test him out later. Hey, yo! Tabushi's right here. I thought he was a little bit more south, but I guess not. So it's not very well known, but the only other way to get ingots aside from smelting is to farm Bushi drops. He'll drop 2 to 3 ingots every time we beat him, and we can only beat him once every hour. So you can roughly get 6 ingots every 3 hours this way, which is enough for 6 Pokeballs. Either way, right now we're too low level to even attempt to fight Bushi, so we're just gonna keep going as planned. Because this man is always holding a grenade, we're gonna call him Bakugo. 
With the official enlistment of Bakugo, we made ourselves a shield and continued onward in our adventure. The following morning, we found two factions duking it out. Since we haven't seen these burly mercs before, we try to catch them before the Syndicate Thugs kills them. Yeah, we failed. I should have shot the Syndicate Thugs first. To make me feel better after losing those mercs, I decided to incite violence between these Fox Sparks and Sweepa. I then hid behind the Sweepa to avoid the thugs that were still after me. I quite literally sat here for two minutes. And even the dogs came in for a bite of poor Sweepa. I came in like a thief and swiped my first totally ethical boss kill. It was only after I kept getting chased by this hound that I sent out Bakugo, and he did this. That's right, he does grenade level damage. And mind you, he's only level 5. We continued along the beach and found a level 30 traveling merchant. We're good on Pokeballs, so we stocked up on as many arrows as we could, and then we tried to catch him. Just kidding, there's no way we can catch him. But, you know what, we'll still try. Yeah, no, just kidding. Even with our whole team incapacitated, we keep it pushing. Ever so slowly getting closer to our goal. There it is. That's the border the feds don't want me to cross. I decided to set up a temporary base for now so our companions can come back to life. Since I don't have tails, I need to collect my own resources, so I spent the night chopping trees and picking up items. After killing the Celeray, I reached the highest level in the game, level 6. On my way home, I found another Syndicate camp, so I decided to try my luck catching a Syndicate gunner. After many days in Pal World, we finally have a full party. We gave him a test run, and as expected, not as good as Bakugo, but still decent. On this archipelago beach lies a mercenary with a wounded knee, which is actually perfect for us because we need a token handicap worker to virtue signal we're an ethical corporation. Her story is actually quite touching, the syndicate has taken everything away from her, and she gives us her last supplies so we can live. Worry not, we will save you, because we are an ethical corporation. Get in the ball, it's for your own sake. Holy crap, she really doesn't want to be saved. Okay. We finally went back to base and filled up our entire party. I don't know exactly when, but we named our syndicate gunners Stormtrooper and our merc with a wounded knee, Wounded Knee. For now. Upon catching our first shoddy clone, we hit level 7. It was short, but when we got back to our temporary base, we packed up everything and left nothing behind. Wink wink, by the way. Wink wink. We continued our journey exploring and exploring and exploring some more. We're getting pretty close to our smiley face, it's actually just southwest beyond this mountain, and we can follow the shore to get there. Bro, this is such a long walk to get here. It's all good. I got back to my stuff fine. I found a nice open area with a dungeon in the back, and decided this would be a good place to call home. 
Before the night fully came, I made a small little starter hut. I placed my bed and called it a night. So I was actually feeling a bit quirky, so I decided to expand my hut into a mega hut. I don't really know what I'm building. We're gonna keep this tree. It has nice aesthetic. It was when I was finally going to let my humans free that I realized something was terribly wrong. Where are the rest of my humans? I had lost two of my humans. Thinking this was all a cruel joke, I backtracked all the way to my old temporary base and found nothing. I had even checked through my recordings, but I had cleaned up everything on the beach. If I had dropped them, it had to have been here. I didn't want to give up, but nighttime was approaching quickly. And that's when I found it. There it is! In the middle of the freaking river! <sighs> Reunited at last. Luckily enough, because it was nighttime, we were able to find these bright blue balls. If we had given up any sooner, we probably would have lost them forever. With that mishap out of the way, we continue to expand and build our base. <sighs> 6 a.m. and it's time to chop some wood. I have three enemies, the pale box, wood, and stone. In order to progress my base level, I build a berry farm even though I'm not going to use it. With the campfire down, we reach base level 5. We add a few more things across our base to reach base level 6 and base level 7. We use all of our lift monk effigies to downgrade our catch rate three times. Wait, I have information about your car's extended warranty! I love resource gathering without pails. We enter our first dungeon at level 9. I am so glad we found Bakugo early on. And we only found him because we're trying to catch one of every human. Unless we find someone with a rocket launcher or a Toko Toko strap to their chest, it's likely no one is going to out damage Bakugo. So we go through this dungeon pretty much one-shotting everyone, mine some ores, collect all the chests, and fight the boss. Lamb Ball. Bakugo's dead. With Bakugo dying, the fight went from like a 3 hit kill to a 100 hit kill. And it's okay. So we got back home and expanded a bit more. We're not gonna use this, but it'll be pretty. We'll just put six ingots in there. We make another berry farm and hit base level eight. We should have made this normal parachute like five episodes ago. We also make some heat resistant armor and head into our second dungeon. Without trying to bore you, this is how the boss fight went. Wow! Maybe beating the first two dungeons made me a little bit cocky, but I went in to fight these three goats and they lit me up with some combo attacks. And I was quickly humbled. Oh, let me get out, let me get out, I regret my decisions. Roll, damn it, roll. Bruh. You know, that wasn't the best showing, but it's okay. Because even if we can't beat three goats, we can at least beat a cute for it.
We find another dungeon, and this time we face a Gamas. We literally just face a boss Gamas, so we're just gonna off-screen him. At the dusk of night, we're able to capture two more Syndicate thugs. The next morning, I was feeling a bit frisky, so I decided to provoke this Mamorist and see if he would take some fall damage. Nice! Going back to the small settlement, we sell all of our spoils and catch the innkeeper as well as the gossiping villager. We name our second syndicate gunner after the first ferocious stormtrooper. The innkeeper logs names and is a logging foreman, hence her name will be Logs. Even my editor doesn't like these stupid nicknames. Wait, that's me. But it's still funny, so I'ma leave it in there. It's about time we set out to do what we wanted to do, so we cross this border and reach this beach. Now this beach is very special for a few reasons. One, it has a settlement. And two, it has natural bushi spawns. We're just here to scout out the area for now, but soon enough we'll want to make our second base here. Oh no, he's angry. Oh no, there's there's three of- oh my god, this is a disaster. Yeah, everything went according to plan. So I got back to my stuff, but there's some things I wanted to test. Do Bushi teleport on platforms? What if I'm elevated? Do they need line of sight? Can I visit their mom? More than likely, we're going to die a few times to get some answers to these questions. Well, he's below me. Ow. I had an idea, but I needed a lot of materials, so I spent two whole in-game days chopping stone and mining wood. I entered another dungeon and caught two more syndicate thugs. Upon beating the boss, I hit level 14. I beat up two more dungeons and rank up to level 15. Since we're level 15 now, I think we can take on the boss penguin. So we target the little ones first. Nick kinda close at the end. We continue our dungeon rushes, speed running the boss rooms, beating Dinosum, Puddler, Anglet, and the boss. We capture two more syndicate thugs on the way home and our first burly Burke. After a long day of fighting bosses, we came back home and did some building. My base had this other open area on the side of the cliff, so I decided to build here. I wanted a 3D cliffside village theme to decorate the staircase leading up to my main area. You know, why is it after making like a staircase village thing do I learn how to make perfect stairs going up? Shortly after our base building break, we went back to fighting bosses. We beat this Hucrates, and upon beating this Ruby, we leveled up to level 17. We want a few more Grenadiers on our team because when Bakugo dies, and he dies fairly often, our DPS becomes negligible. We catch a total of 4 Grenadiers and can now make a full team of them. We also catch 3 more Syndicate Thugs for our condensation goals, we must not forget about that. We get home and name two of our grenadiers after the first Baku Roku and Baku Nana. We try our best to beat this water snake, but all of our Bakus die since they're pretty underleveled, so we humbly retreat. Selling away all of our goodies gives us a total of 34,000 coins. We then buy a thousand arrows and a hundred pal spheres. 
I then promptly use those Pal Spheres to catch me a village chief, a researcher, and four syndicate grenadiers. In preparation to fight Zoe and Grisbolt, we repair our armor and tools, as well as beat tanking again to level up our new damage dealers. It is time. I am whipping so bad, no one look. Bakuroku, no! It's okay, we still have Bakugo and Nana. so close. Oh, that was bad dodge. It's okay, one more hit. We could die here if we got one shot. <laughs> nah, we're good. Yep, that is one boss down. Still four more to go. Shortly after the first tower boss, we enter another dungeon and reach level 18. We go back to the beach and capture all of the villagers. On top of that, we capture our first pale merchant. We go back to testing Bushi mechanics. And die. So we try it again. Oh, he teleported! And on the stairs, that's good. And he takes fall damage. And we're dead. We may have died a few times, but I feel like we're getting very valuable information. There's another Gucci. I want to confirm if they teleport on elevated platforms. Oh, they do. <laughs> That's good, at least. Okay, so I want to bait this Bushi into hitting the officer. And hopefully the officer can kill him. I have attracted the attention of some Doomit as well, so they should all start damaging each other. Oh, I'm very good at this game. Hopefully, these guys don't despawn if I stay here. Okay, I don't think I hear the Bushi attacks anymore, so he should be dead. Our first two ingots! Let's go! Oh my god. Thank goodness we're making progress. Now for the real test. Can Bushi teleport onto staircases or platforms high in the sky? I see a Bushi. Come on. Wait, 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 wait. He's dead! Wait, no, he's not. Wait, yeah, yeah, he is. He's dead! And just like that, we got our second Bushi kill. Three more ingots. We spend our next day doing some more Bushi testing. It turns out we need line of sight with him for him to teleport to us. Otherwise, he'll run or teleport below us and we can't get him back up here. It's also possible, if we're close to the edge, that he won't teleport up here. 
I think the ideal trap, if it exists, is he TPs to us where he can't hit us, moves over an inch, and then falls 20 stories all by himself without us having to do anything. More than likely though, we'll have to make a design where we have to break one tile in order to kill him. Oh shoot! I was not expecting him to actually see me up here. Oh, I'm alive. I'm alive. Haha, <laughs> sucker! We've killed level 40 Bushi now. Level 23 does not scare me. Yeah. You know, while we're here, might as well talk about what I'm planning. Yeah. So you might be wondering, why am I going through all of this effort to kill Bushi more efficiently? One, because I plan on doing more challenge runs in the future. If I did land ball only, I would still have issues getting metal, so more than likely, this will also help other content creators trying to follow suit. I think it will be useful and helpful for everyone. Back to the beach and I tested a few different designs. What is that? Not all of them worked perfectly. We tried platforms, platforms with holes in the middle, platforms under platforms. Standing on these triangles seems to be working pretty well for line of sight. Also, I just want to say I'm enjoying jump scaring you guys with these cuts. I hope the audience retention stays high from it. Since this is my first video, I can just treat this as a test project. By the way, did I tell you guys that these ingots and bushi tests do not go without sacrifice? No really, I've died a lot. But it's all good because it's for the sake of science. With all of the work we've done so far, we can finally make some nails and a high quality workbench. We unlock the Mega Shield and the Mega Glider. We also unlock the PAL Condenser, but we're gonna need 19 more ingots before we can make it. We tried to capture our first Syndicate Cleaner, but due to unfortunate circumstances, we died. We go for round 2 and actually manage to catch him. We even managed to catch our first Devout Hypocrite. Those were two enemies with very low catch rates. Our team is pretty stacked now with all of our Bakus, but we still give all of our new recruits a test run. I give our Syndicate Cleaner the name Anatoly, because he is the cleaner. By the way, the Wandering Merchants and Pal Merchants do no damage. Anatoly at least does some damage. While we were at the starter area, I decided to test my luck and try to catch a PIDF officer. We used all of our green, blue, yellow, red, magenta, purple, orange, everything I had, and it was not enough. At least we were close on the red. With our team members leveled up now, we go and fight the blue snake once again. But then I hear something in the corner of my ear. A blue and shiny seahorse. We try to finish this boss fight quickly, but it does take a while. We killed Azerobe and then focused our attention to the kelp sea. Oh my god, solar people? Our team was now in critical health, but we were able to come out on top against these two sea creatures. After beating a few more Syndicate Grunts, we were able to reach level 20. We upgraded to Uncommon Pelt Armor and made a rare old bow. After collecting some Bushi Drops, I realized our Grenadiers don't take any damage from these Pyre Martyr guys. We use this to our advantage to get some free experience.
You know, there's something just so satisfying about Abushi doing everything it can to TP to you and then falling to its death five seconds later. Before going back with all of our ingots, we sell our dungeon loot and buy a janky pistol. It's taken us so long, but we've finally done it. We have made a Pal Condenser. With the Pal Condenser made, we condense four humans into both Bakuhachi and Bakunana. We move our sensor of base over here so it actually covers everything in the base. Unfortunately, since this part was outside of my base, I had lost half of my staircase village thing, but that's okay because we have the general idea in our head. So I got to work rebuilding this area and somehow I think I made it look even better than it was before. I think eventually we'll change the interior walls to stone, but this is how it looks right now. We'll have to find some function for this place. With our condensation goals finally coming into fruition, we start capturing a lot of humans. I was able to capture 11 humans in 2 dungeons, and we could do more if we wanted to. Shortly after, we take on King Paka and start by taking out his 2 minions. I use King Paka as a damage test for all of my team members. Bakunana does about 70 damage per hit, Bakuroku does about 60, both Bakugo and Bakuhachi does the same about 67. So yeah, I think we're going to condense Bakunana into the superhuman we were hoping for. We take some time to explore and unlock the desolate church waypoint at level 21. Look at how fast this guy is. Wow, I am shook it. That was a 2% catch on the first try. We unlock some more waypoints and move closer towards the second tower boss fight. I move through the darkness of night, and thinking that I refilled my stamina bar, I jump off into my bed. <laughs> I died so far away from any waypoints, on top of that there are mountains in the way. Wonderful. Since I'm over here right now, I actually take a detour from getting my stuff because there's a waypoint right on the left. I send out Anatoly to take the B-Guard's aggro, just so I won't blow up. Wait, why are you after me? Oh my... So I blew up. Or so I didn't. I am alive. Oh, I am dead. I decided to quickly move past them. And so I got my stuff back, but I wanted to lose it all very quickly. So I entered a level 29 dungeon. So I got my stuff back and I didn't do anything stupid like entering a level 29 dungeon. The dev who made this ramp here to the top of this ravine is the MVP. Whoever put B-Guard spawns at the top of this ramp needs therapy. Having enough stressful exploring, I went to go fight another boss. Making it back home, we moved our pale condenser to this rock. 
We've captured more than enough humans to get Bakunana to the second tier, so we go ahead and do it. We test our damage on King Paka again, and you know what? It's pretty good. So I came over to the small settlement and did some testing. Some human testing. How do I catch these humans as efficiently as possible? I think the answer we arrived at was Firebow. And so we got to work. In the next 10 or so minutes, I caught 15 humans. I think that's pretty efficient. Dirty two humans sacrificed for a mere 7% increase in power. <laughs> I must be losing my mind, but I'm going to keep that in there. We downgrade our catch rate once again, and enhance our Bakunana's attack power as much as we can. We were able to add another 21% to our attack this way. We need 64 humans for our final tier which is 116 humans in total. Let's go and farm some boss fights. <laughs> we sell all of the loot we don't need and are able to purchase 225 coarse ammo. Looks like both metal and money will be hard to come by. I think our three heaviest hitters deserves their own unique name, so I name Bakunana Nanami, and I name Bakuhachi Hekigaya Hachiman. In order to progress our base level further, we make some nails and place down a sphere workbench. I could break down our pal condenser among other things for metal and rebuild it later, but since we need more metal anyways, we'll just go and farm Bushi. I wonder if Bushi can TP to me up here. Yeah, I don't think that's especially useful. So we just beat our first naturally spawned Bushi, which means from this point forward, if we die to a Bushi, it's completely a skill issue. Unfortunately, even with four yellow balls, I wasn't able to capture this fire martyr. We find ourselves another Bushi. While we hunt Bushi, we kill some fire martyrs and reach level 24. What the? I am so confused, whatever. Shiny Ragnahawk. We tried to kill this Ragnahawk and enlisted the help of these Pyre Martyrs and Abushi, but we stood no chance. At least we got a free ingot off of him. Hey look, we're fine. Now with a total of 24 ingots saved up, we can finally craft our cooler and upgrade our base to level 10. And this upgrade means we can finally set up a base at our Bushi Trap. Before that, my gun and armor are all broken. Every 300 bullets I shoot, I need to decide whether to spend 14 metal or 17,000 coins. Let's see if I can increase my Bushi killing efficiency. But first, using 20 of our ingots, we finally make us a mega grappling gun. 
We completely skipped the first grappling gun, because I think it's not worth the ingots, but now we have mobility. I finally get a pale box down here, and now we can TP in between bases. So I'm trying a different design right now, and it's not very good. I don't know why so many things are angry at me. I decide to scrap a whole bunch of unnecessary parts to this trap. This actually gives me way more line of sight where the walls used to be. I forgot to mention this earlier, but every time I teleport back here or re-log, all the spawns reset. So every time I don't get a Bushi, I can teleport away and teleport back, and this is a lot faster than re-logging. I don't need to run, and the kills are easy. I was testing some more stuff, and then we got our first raid. I guess our other base just doesn't get any raids. Which is kinda nice, because it's just wood. If I stand more towards the middle of this roof, then I think the Bushi will always teleport here. There's our test subject. Even though it doesn't look like he has line of sight, I think he does. And I don't know why. Yeah, he's still teleporting. Oh, there's another one. Ooh, he's on the triangle. That's not good. Come here, Bushi. Okay, there we go. Bye! With a decent Bushi setup, we take a break from ingot farming and fight some new bosses. We fight Mewtwo Waifu and struggle a bit at first, but after learning her moves, we adjusted and were able to dodge her attacks. Before we fight more bosses, we beat a few dungeons and hit level 27. We sell all the loot we got for $35,000. And don't worry, I'm keeping all the good blueprints and amulets. We catch a few more humans, kill a few more Bushis, and then go on and fight Univolt. All of Univolt's attacks are very easy to read, we just don't want to get hit and stunned by them. Next on my list is Relaxorus Lux. He does have an attack that's pretty fast and hard to read, but the rest of his attacks are pretty easy to dodge. We take on a level 29 dungeon real quick, and then fight Alphadran. Now, Alpha Dran was an issue. These blue tornadoes do so much damage, she also has the same fast purple attack. She also has a fast fire attack. 
I just ate some tacos before this fight, and my reaction time is not up to speed. We actually get her very low, but I was unable to outrun these stupid blue tornadoes that track you. I'm very confident we can beat her though, I just need to digest these tacos. <sighs> Let's take a break, and do something very evil. <laughs> So <laughs> Nanami now has 45% more attack than our next two best damage dealers. I think it's time for us to tackle our level 40 dungeon we have in our backyard. We send out Nanami and slowly but surely, he clears the entire room. We get very lucky, because at our first intersection, we can see the boss room. This is great because if we can kill the boss, we can loot the entire dungeon without having to deal with any enemies. So we do a little bit of cheese and whittle him all the way down. Upon exiting the dungeon, I wonder if the world has been turned upside down, because things are very slanty. I thought I was going crazy. I mean, I am going crazy. But am I crazy enough to build in a slanted area without noticing? So I leave the game and come back. Still slanty. Change my settings. Still slanty. I guess we were just slanted the whole time, and we didn't even notice. It's time for us to unlock the second boss tower. To be honest, the only reason why we haven't unlocked it yet is because it's on a mountain. But now we have a grappling hook. Still gotta climb a bit though. The area is a bit chilly, but we make it to the waypoint just fine. I don't have high hopes, but we give this waifu a test run. Is the girl the waifu? Or is the pal the waifu? You'll never know. We'll probably die this run, but we want to see how much damage we can do and what her moves are. Jank pistol headshot damage actually isn't that bad. That is baloney. Before we do though, let's get some metal and hit level 29. Look at all of this loot. A total of 36 ingots. Guys, we have 77 shots, a bow, and pre-metal armor. Do you believe in me? Huh? <laughs> 
decent pace until we run out of ammo. Whoa. Fine if everyone else dies, we can't do Sanami though. slow gonna have to tank for me buddy
We got this. Alright, you're gonna have to tank everything, Nanami. Let's go. Oh my god. Whoa. Can you believe it? Dear viewer, as you may have noticed, we're nearing the end of this video. I have run out of storage and deleted both Apex Legends and Counter Strike 2 so I could keep recording. Unfortunately, I couldn't fit my whole playthrough into one video, so I'll be making a part 2. But before then, let's be as many bosses as we can and hit level 30. Patelia was pretty easy. The fight was just like an easier version of Lyleen. We dodged the fast attacks and put on the damage with Nanami.
We beat Vitalia and hit level 30. Next up, Elizabeth. I know she has B guards, so I throw my tank engine in there first to pull aggro. Did I tell you Anatoly is my tank? He's been letting my team heal the entire playthrough while he soaks in the damage. He just tanked a 99 million damage self-destructing bee like it was nothing. Now even though we had killed the guards, Elizabeth was still quite difficult. All of her attacks are fast and her close range AoE is very large. We get into a groove towards the middle of the fight and dodge all of her attacks. It was towards the end where we really started to choke. Oh no, Nanami's one shot. Oh, they switched targets. What am I doing? What am I doing? What am I doing? Oh my god, we cut it very close at the end. You know if you're gonna make content, you gotta make it very close. Finally, it was time to get revenge on Alpha Dran. We have a game plan this time. We let Nanami do the heavy hitting and stay far away to dodge the fast attacks. There we have it, level 30, 2 tower bosses, and 1 fully condensed human. You may be thinking, Yin, you barely did enough damage to the second tower. How will you beat the game? And I would just say, I think we may have had the answer in our hands the entire time. But I guess you'll just have to find out next time. Thank you so much for watching, and hopefully I'll see you in the next two weeks with part two. If we can get one like, and one subscribe, I will do a Lamball only challenge.